Hey there, welcome to Over the Horizon. It's been a pretty crazy week for Elon Musk's companies, but um, not as crazy as it has been for SpaceX. Elon made uh, quite a, a groundbreaking announcement uh, when he talked about how um, you know SpaceX is going to colonize Mars. And uh, I thought we'd break it down with uh, our panel of experts. We have uh, some unusual faces and someone new. We've got uh, Scott Walter. Uh, you have uh, know him and Ozan on over the horizon, but we've got a special guest today, Ben Inouye from uh, NASA JPL. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, it's a pleasure yeah, to be thanks here. Thanks for getting us together. Yeah. yeah. Look forward to this. All right. So uh, let's just go around the panel and have a quick uh, kind of first impressions, uh, first takeaways from it. Scott, let's begin with you. Well, I guess the first thing is I wasn't where they were doing it on, on that Friday night because that was the infamous RoboTaxi tweet came at the same time. So Elon was like really busy right. between doing that and then putting that thing out there. And so uh, the next day it was, it was interesting to go through because there was definitely a lot to unpack. We had already unpacked a lot about what Gwen had talked about like a month before with uh, talking about uh, IFT4. And I think right. that the main thing is that uh, uh, when we get to the images of the next three starships that are coming up, that's hmm. we want to talk about what's in those images and pick that apart. But I'll I'll wait until everyone else has sort of had a chance for their first impressions. All right, Ben, do you want to jump in? Both sure. Parts? Yeah, I I actually really enjoyed uh, watching his all hands there. I think it was a very aspirational uh, discussion, and it, it kind of uh, sparked some some memories from a recent podcast that Casey Dreyer did with the Planetary Society discussing. Uh, real versus acceptable reasons for, you know, investment in space. And I think he was doing a, a pretty good job of kind of combining the two of them. Um, you know, these are very lofty goals and you know, they're, they're far out, you know, they're from sci-fi, it seems like. And, um, but yeah, I think he did a good job of trying to bring them within reach and, and let people use the real justifications for, uh, for investing in something pretty, yeah, you know, like I said, aspirational. Yeah, it was on. Uh, yeah, so I had a few takeaways, but I think the the biggest thing for me was that the goals, in some way, even though they got more ambitious in mm -hmm. terms of the hardware, uh, it seems like it got more realistic, and it's just kind of a shorter shorter leap from uh, what they're doing in the short term to what they what they want to use at least to start out. Or you know what what they're baselining uh, yeah. um, for <clears throat> transporting uh, a lot of stuff to Mars. I think uh, Elon was a lot more circumspect, a lot more realistic, as you rightly say. Um, you know, we we used to Elon giving these you know big grand ideas and and these these timelines and you know the, the you know the accusation the, you know, the criticism of him is he never sticks to the timelines and you know that's we've come to expect that from Elon, but. I think he was he 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 tried to drill down uh, on a bit uh, with a bit of realism uh, about exactly the stages that he would see Starship going through uh, in this this grand plan of colonizing Mars. Um, just a little note here for uh, for those of you watching, Ben here is in his uh, in his personal capacity, uh, and so uh, you know I just wanted to point that out so that uh, you know we don't get any wires crossed. Okay, so um, Ozan. Let's let's start off with um, you know the since you were the guy who brought this to our, to our attention the moment mm -hmm. it happened. <laughs> what's what is the most ambitious uh, you know aspect of of this presentation that you you think you know we got here? <laughs> well, I, I think it was the production rate, right? So they the original plan, as I remember it, was you know we're going to take about ten synods, um, so a little over twenty years to transport. Um, uh, on the order of a million tons to Mars, so about a hundred thousand tons per synod. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of you would be ramping up to that, right? So it, it, I guess yeah. that was sort of average. And, and he mentioned it was what about uh, a couple of at least a couple of starships a day. Well, yeah, yeah. So 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 just going back to the original plan, right? So the original mm -hmm. what we had heard before was about a million tons every every time. Um, Sorry, about a hundred thousand tons every time. So that's a thousand starships, and you would produce those over twenty years, and uh, and you know you would get them back and reuse them. So they 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 were talking about uh, returning them in the same synod, which is like a really hard hard thing to do, and 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 reusing it. But it was it was like 
a, a lofty but very um, grounded or, you know, um, acceptable production rate of 50 starships a year that, that for, for this program. Yeah. To get to that thousand over 20 years and then sort of average over a few decades. Right. Uh, but what they have switched to is basically increasing the, the total mass that goes. So now instead of a thousand starships, they're talking about thousands of starships going every time. And they've kind of ditched that uh, reusing the Mars starships um, plan. And they're, they're talking about only bringing them back uh, when when they're bringing when people necessary. cargo back. Yeah, yeah when necessary. Yeah. Most of them would be yeah. one way. Yeah. And that basically leads to producing thousands of starships over the course of about two years, which is, you know, multiple starships a day, which, hmm. you know, the spelled out yeah, you know I, I can't help i when i heard that i couldn't help but wonder because you know we were talking about the the, the re-entry problem with the heat tiles and we were talking about earlier in, in the early episode about you know maybe you could just have starship as a one-way um you know vehicle and you wouldn't need uh to solve such a big re-entry problem on the moon or on mars as you would on earth because of i mean the difference in atmosphere uh do you think all of that is taken into account yeah so my my best guess at what happened is um the propellant production on Mars, they recognize that as the very hard problem that it is. Um, it's not It's not something that you can't solve, but making that economical um, mm. on a short time scale is a hard problem. And, and producing enough to be able to turn the ship back around and then reuse it two years later, that's that's that makes it even harder. It's one thing if you want to use it every five years. It's another if you want to reuse it every two years, or you know a little over two years. Um, right. And at the same time, you know when they had originally come up with that plan, I was they were working with uh, a composite uh, ITS that was probably going to cost a fair amount. Um, they switched to steel, but they still probably didn't know uh, how low they could get the manufacturing cost. And now they've been producing them at a pretty good clip. And they've been working on driving those production costs down and building this mass manufacturing uh, capability before they even have achieved orbit. And so I think now they have a sense of, oh, we can build these really cheap and maybe the economics works out better if we just send them one way and don't try to build out this reuse capability. Hmm. Right. But it, it was slightly different for the booster, right, Scott? I mean, because he did talk about, um, he, he played out this uh, video, which I'm going to just play out. Uh, and he did talk about, uh, you know, trying to stick the landing of the booster on the chopsticks in IFT-5. Uh, they try and see if they could bring it back to a virtual, um, you know, virtual Mechazella on the water. This time around, it's IFT-4. And then maybe try their luck and bring it, bring it down onto the chopsticks in IFT-5, which was interesting effort. Yeah, and that makes sense because that's the probably the most expensive component there if you just look at the, the count of the number of engines. So um, if the, the Starship is making a one-way trip, that's not um, as bad as, as if you were making these things expendable. And of course, it will have utility in Mars anyways, as far as kind of resource itself. I mean, you're, I'm pretty sure the stainless steel will be valuable there. And who knows, mm -hmm. maybe there'll be even some components in the Raptors that could be used for a variety of other things. So your engine counts a lot less. Um, and again, if you're not thinking about having to come back to Earth, you still have a slight reentry problem in Mars. You know, there is going to be a certain amount of heating because you're going to be using it for the, the aero raking, but uh, maybe that will be a little bit easier to do. Now, I've always felt, I mean, going way back, I think in the mid 90s, when I first heard about Robert Zubrin's uh, uh, Mars Direct, that I always felt that the way to go was like make it a one way trip because you add so much complexity to your architecture when you worry about coming back. So if your focus is like, no, you're going there to stay. Think about what you need to do there. You can almost get there a lot sooner and build a colony. It's basically, you remember Cortez, he burned the ships. <laughs> so it's the same kind of approach that you really motivate everyone and realize it's only one way, especially if they know it to begin with. And part of my rationale was for it is that in the early days, NASA was always looking at two possible scenarios going way back to the 60s or like when they were going to do these attempts in the 80s. It was either a 30-day stay on Mars or an 18-month one. And so they were already thinking that we could put astronauts there for 18 months. My family was like, Wait a minute, you can put them there for 18 months. You can easily put them there for 18 years. I mean, you just do some resupply and everything else. 
So my overall feeling is that it makes sense. And there's more than enough people, believe it or not, it sounds crazy, but there's actually more than enough people that would be willing to make that one-way trip. And if they understand it yeah. right from the beginning, that that's what's going on, that they're kind of prepared for it, they'd be able, uh, able to do it. I think the other thing is that Elon was on a spaces yesterday in which he gave us some more data. And I can't remember what he said yesterday and what he said on Friday. But I think on Friday, he didn't really give any time frames. But yesterday, I believe he did. He was saying that within the next five years, you would probably see the first starships going to Mars unmanned. And then within 10 years, I think maybe he even said as low as, as like seven years, potentially, uh, you would see the first uh, manned uh, programs uh, actually going to Mars. So he was starting to put some some times on there. Yeah, I, I thought he's, he did mention by the end of this decade. So, I mean, it would probably be around that time, 2930, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But he was a bit more earliest. concrete in the spaces yesterday about that when, when asked. Right, okay. Okay. All right, Ben, um, you're the guy, uh, you know, on the panel with the most experience on Mars <laughs> with, uh, you know, the, everything that is Mars. Uh, you know, uh, give us give us your sense of perhaps some of the challenges that, you know, lie, lie out there that we aren't... Sure anticipating or SpaceX might be missing out from what your experience has been with the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And I guess, um, you know, I'll tie in a little bit of additional experience. My my wife actually uh, was a former or is a former SpaceX employee. Um, she was part of the team that built Dragon 2 or Crew Dragon. Um, and so I was pretty close to it when when that vehicle actually had landing legs on it still, you know, and they referred to it as, as the red dragon and so um i think that was back in 2016 we were supposed to be launching to mars in, in 24 uh right. and that's not happening and i don't actually you know working in aerospace i don't fault missing that that date is super super aggressive um but you know sometimes you use those dates as management tools to motivate your people to get going for whatever reason and i i think that um it was nice to to hear these concrete dates. I I, I am skeptical, uh, but I can I I am assured. I don't doubt Elon's ability to execute on crazy things um, faster than we think he should be able to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the the timeline's always debatable. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. I you know it seems like um, it just. I'm just continually amazed at, at how uh, these things that maybe shouldn't be working um, or everyone says aren't going to work or uh, are destined for failure seem to, you know, turn into a company that can probably carry 90, I think he said 99% of the world's cargo to space um, yeah. in a couple of years. Uh, and, yeah. and that's just incredible. Um, you know, some of the I challenges... Think it's, it's already, uh, what, about around 80% of the world's cargo per year? Going towards yeah. 90 this year, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's wild. Um, yeah. uh, you know, some of the numbers that I saw in the all hands, uh, 10 launches per day um, to make the, the mass numbers feasible. Um, I, I don't dare say that's crazy, it won't happen, but uh, that's, that is ambitious, um, mm -hmm. 10 launches per day. Um, <laughs> so uh e even and i think even that took 10 years to get the total mass required out there so like 10 launches per day for 10 years and uh that's that's outrageous um but i'm excited to see the attempt at it um i also appreciate you know most of the video we're watching and and listening to his words and i i was thinking i'll repeatedly that he was addressing um how we get there uh and kind of you know in in my experience obviously i'm not doing propulsion vehicles or boosters or any of these uh you know first stage of travel type projects and everything that i'm doing is is once we get to mars like how you know for the helicopters for example it's been a very difficult challenge of keeping them you know, cool enough during operation on Mars and then warm enough uh, when global dust storms hit and the days are short and Mars is uh, 1.6 times farther away from the sun as it is during its uh, closest approach. And so uh, therein lies some pretty significant challenges that are in front of them. And I, I do appreciate that he addressed that they are 
quote trying to you know take care of the horse before the before the cart which which does make mm -hmm. sense but they there are um again science fiction level challenges about how do we how do we deal with actually being there um mm -hmm. you know it, it's I, I think habitation is is really important um you know dealing with really cold nights and potentially even quite warm days uh you know i think one of the the biggest long-term challenges that i don't think that humanity even has a uh, I guess that right now is the idea of terraforming or putting water on there without an active uh, planetary core. Um, but I, I do think it's the right approach uh, to, to get, you know, let, let's build the technology and the infrastructure to get there. Um, and once we have a critical mass and the ability to move things there, then we'll have a lot more opportunity. Um, you know, to, to solve some of these more uh, abstract uh, problems that we're facing. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's some of the same challenge that we're, we're facing with Mars sample return. Um, you know, how, how do you get something there that also carries its own infrastructure? And uh, I think it's a very different approach that SpaceX is, is taking, and that is rather than try and make everything as small as possible so you minimize uh, the value of your rocket equation um mm. just build your launch vehicle and your and your infrastructure to carry massive amounts of stuff um and if they can get to 10 launches a day then then my hat's off for sure yeah <laughs> oh yeah to build off of what ben is saying uh, that uh, scale is something yeah. that that actually makes some of those other problems easier to solve for example, right. the, um, the thermal management is a lot harder to solve it on a small uh, component or a small spacecraft than uh, than to, to solve it on something big where you have that thermal mass and you have the you have the budget for insulation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, um, and, and that's actually you know we're working on a a follow on helicopter now and, and we're looking at um, you know probably 20 times the mass of ingenuity. Uh, and it's specifically for that reason, um, you know, the more the more mass you can fly, the easier it is to manage the, the thermal engineering of the vehicle. Do you do you think, uh, Scott, that right now we're, we're seeing the wherewithal, we're seeing, you know, all the pieces put in place to to get to the cadence of, of, of building these, the boosters and starships, and then getting to the cadence of launches and the evolution of this vehicle. Yeah, so from the update, I think I was pleasantly surprised at how, um, I guess, ambitious they are and that they're they're going to do the, the capture of the booster a lot sooner than I expected. Um, yeah. I thought it would be a lot longer before they attempted to do that. So uh, that that's a positive thing. And then also uh, attempting to capture the Starship so um, that's, I, I guess they're kind of encouraged with what they see, and it is definitely quite motivating. The fact that they're going to be building um, a second uh, mechazole right. there, as well as in the Cape, and using the, the Cape for, for most of it, makes it possible. I mean, still, my goodness, you know, ten times a day—that's that's crazy. Because I'm just trying to think of how how you keep up the uh, you know the fuel, the fuel <laughs> and oxidizer. I mean, I mean yeah, for right. that, that is just a tremendous amount, and um, they're going to. They're not going to be trucking that amount in there. They're, they're going to have, have some local production or something set up to be able to. Yeah, that. that's they'll just need a shipping amount. port down there, probably. Yeah. To, oh yeah, it's it, it, it's it's insane. I right after the or, the or Artemis, a pipeline. Yeah, yeah, right after the Artemis launch, the hotel I was staying in, they had a bunch of trucks that came in with liquid hydrogen to, I guess, to to recharge everything. I just couldn't believe how many of them were there. There was like at least sixteen of them there, and you know, the, I think this, this was being produced maybe in Alabama or Georgia or somewhere. So they got to truck them down like all the infrastructure and the truckers got to stay over, you know, I mean, you just, you don't realize how much it is, especially for a big booster. And we're talking about something larger than the Saturn V as far as the amount of locks you would need for that, the amount of uh, you know, also the propellant. So that is going to require quite the infrastructure to be able to do it. And I think it's also interesting to see how the stack has changed. I mean, that's, that I think is is the you know I, I want to hear Ozon's take on some mm -hmm. of the stuff because of those three boosters next to each other and the evolution that they're looking at the fact that they're already looking 
like a generation ahead of this. Like, oh, wait a minute, what? Why are you having the one in the middle? Why don't you just go the one, the, the third one that they're deciding to to stretch it out? The the thing about that, we have to be very careful of seeing whether that's like kind of an aspirational thing and whether how close the drawing is to the actual vision, because there seems to be some inconsistencies in there. I know yep. Zach Golden has pointed a few things out. I I kind of noticed that first. It looks like they're integrating the uh, the inner stage right into the design now, as opposed to it being a ring. Um, they want it to be there. They do show the scale, and the problem I had when I looked at it, especially when you get very close, it appears to me the other two rockets are thinner than the original, and that could be an optical illusion because you know sometimes when you play with perspectives, your eyes get tricked. And so I decided to actually take that and look at that up close and make the measurements. And it seems that both of them are about 9% thinner than the first <laughs> one. That could also be that they are shaded differently because, it, like, again, you're trying to find where is the edge on these things. And yeah. I thought, oh, okay, what they did is they, they, they got the proportions right, but they scaled it wrong. And then I checked the height. And based on the height, the sc it scaled correctly in the height. But I don't believe they made it, it thinner. It makes no sense that they would reduce the diameter. I, I, I cannot see any reason to reduce the diameter if you're going taller. No. I mean, you're going taller because no. you want to bring more fuel and you don't do it by making it thinner unless yeah. I'm missing something in there. <laughs> but I think we agree that there's something about it. And the fins also look a little bit funny. They're different than yeah. the original one. So they're playing around with something there. Yeah. Um, and or know, are we reading too much into it? Yes, that's Again, we're reading too much into it. It's... Uh... It's easy to read too much into this. Like we're hungry for information, but I think there's it's just like very up in the air. I remember three years ago or four years ago when they came out with a uh, maybe four to five years ago when they came out with the uh, payload user guide. Um, you know, we we got some pretty what seemed like solid information um, in terms of the payload bay um, and, and like the payload envelope, the payload to SSO and payload to GTO from which we could derive some. Um, inert mass figures and it just kind of it made sense right there was this paper rocket that made sense and we could and and that was like fairly consistent for a while and they started like throwing out this stuff that was it, that made it clear that things were diverging from that but also getting fuzzy like there's this like cone of uncertainty that's that's actually <laughs> expanding in terms of what this vehicle is going to be so i've stopped you know i i was doing these uh simulation like you know precise simulations of like what can i do to this what can i do to that and I've just kind of given up on that because um, uh, there's just like too much up in the air. And I don't think that we can take any of these figures at face value. Like a lot of the payload uh, figures are, we're getting them in, in you know, a, you know, aspirational figures rounded to uh, the nearest or, <laughs> or nearest like, order of magnitude. In, in, yeah. In nearest order, like, like nearest 50 tons, right? Like that's, yeah. that's basically it's like, it's going up in 50 ton increments. Um, that said, I think we can, just based based on the direction that this design is evolving in terms of the the prop load and length and the, where you know where the performance targets are it seems like the you know raptor isp coming in lower than originally uh, predicted is not quite enough to account for the mass growth that is uh that seems the, the, the liftoff mass growth that seems necessary to hit these uh, original performance targets, uh, which roughly line up with Starship 2. Um, but again, hard to interpret because 100 plus tons could mean 100 plus tons to uh, low, like very low Earth orbit, you know, reference low Earth orbit, 200 kilometers and like in inclination matching KSC um, latitude. Or they could, as they did in the a uh, user guide back in you know 2020 mean 100 tons to SSO and more to lower orbits, so it could be anywhere in that in that zone, right? Um, but that's like that middle one seems closest to what we were originally promised, and it's it's a fair amount larger with a substantially higher thrust. Um, all and and it seems like there is some uh, inert mass growth that they have sort of accepted or you know they they've put off addressing as Raptors have gotten more performance and just like going for the stretch to hit those performance targets and, and to exceed them, right? The 200 plus tons that's in excess of what um, had been promised before it's, it had been hinted at before, but 
it hadn't really been given as it, it, it wasn't as concrete as, as, it, as it is now. So in some ways it's getting more ambitious, but it's also paired with this like immense vehicle growth uh, that, that that's coming with thrust and uh, thrust density yeah. and, and <laughs> crazy tall ship. But I mean, yeah. that's, it's, not, it's not so crazy tall, right? Like the, the, the finest ratio is still uh, lower than Falcon 9. Yeah, and, and apart from the numbers, all of this means there's more payload to orbit to the moon and to Mars. So Ben, um, this should be exciting for NASA. Yeah, yeah, and of, of course I can't speak on behalf of NASA, but uh, I desperately want, uh, you, you know, I, I'm very committed to Mars sample return. Uh, I desperately wish they would baseline a Starship for Mars sample return launch mm -hmm. uh, in the same vein that they've baselined a Starship for landing humans on the moon, which is three years sooner than we're supposed to launch Mars sample return. Um, it would it would be a paradigm shift in in our okay. design approach. Um, and uh, if I, I may, Ben, I have I have baseline Starship for. <laughs> I in, in my mind, I don't see it not going on one. Um, but I wish that the uh, you know the project itself and NASA would commit to to that direction because mm. it would be it would be a it would be a paradigm shift. It would it would actually allocate some funding to SpaceX from the federal government. Uh, to building Starship for what Elon wants to build it for, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it would it would be better. You, you know, I see a lot of advantages uh, that would come to 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 the country and the world from it. Um, it and I think yeah. that I think we'll get there. I think you're right, Ozon. Uh, I want to see it on paper too, though. <laughs> yeah. do you do you think Ben? It's it's time for. Um, for NASA, the ESA, and a lot more um, government space programs to kind of reorient um, the the evolution of their own programs because it's is it worth pumping money into um, their own uh, launch programs when you have Starship um, evolving at a cadence and a rate that is, I mean, it's it's hard not to see the possibility that this is a vehicle that will succeed. I mean, I, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but I, I don't see the value in SLS. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm not I'm not happy. Uh, we have we you know funding for NASA is tight. I don't think SLS is a great place to put it. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, but I do think the paradigm. You know, the the whole process is shifting uh, yeah. very clearly. You know, I think. Um, the approach to Artemis, uh, and you know, we'll say that the the U.S. governments and, and many organizations around the world are, are dependent on SpaceX at this point um, right. because they're offering, you know, a very good value proposition for launch yeah. services already. Um, and you, already. I mean, can, can you imagine what that's going to be with Starship? I I can't actually. You know, um, <laughs> I wouldn't even dare to guess because. Um, you know, if you could guess along the promises, you're probably going to not be right. But then if you guess about like, you know, what direction they'll go next, you're probably not right either. But either way, I, <laughs> I'm really thrilled to be like, you know, tangential to it and, and impacted by it because it's not negative. Um, that's for sure. I mean, I, I think that, that that does seem to be a growing consensus around the world that it's perhaps time to be more judicious in which uh, in the manner in which these uh uh, government space programs spend or allocate their funds. It's all yep. about resource allocation at the end of the day. And even in space programs, you could do so much more um, if you focus on, you know, the science of it uh, yep. rather than how you get it up there. I, I totally agree with that. And um, the, you know, going back again to, to Mike Griffin and, you uh, um, PC Dryer's podcast, they, they talked a lot about how, uh, you know, how the real reasons we're going to space don't look good on a balance sheet for a company. And so um, I, I'm thrilled at JPL. We get to focus on the science and, and those missions that are just not, they cannot turn a profit and they shouldn't because they're for uh, discovery and exploration. Yeah. Um, but they're in, you know, with launch services and, you know, uh, 
delivery to Mars. You know, we're already using SpaceX on uh, Psyche. We launched uh, on a Falcon Heavy, and uh, Europa Clipper will go on uh, a Falcon Heavy. You know, reusing the boosters that came back from Psyche, um, and that's that is a wonderful place for for private industry to exist. And that's yeah, you know, absolutely. It's it's they're doing a great job too. You know, they they. Yeah. Um, they are very and, reliable, and, and, you, and you're right. There is there is so much there is so much that is not you know that does not need to uh, you know reflect on a balance sheet uh, mm -hmm. that needs to be done in terms of pure science uh, yeah. and discovery, and that's where government programs really can flourish. Um, I think it's I think there is a growing consensus that it's time to give to the private sector what is due to the private sector. You know, yeah. let them handle what they want. Uh, you know, what what they're good at, and I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm Scott and Ozana. I guess you know we haven't seen any real announcement from SpaceX beyond the launch program uh, of actually conducting science or building infrastructure on the Moon or on Mars uh, or in lunar orbit, because there are so many other companies that are doing that and focusing yeah. on that. I mean, they've they've talked a little bit about they've mentioned building a lunar base, right? Yeah, and but I mean, how much of that would extend beyond? You know, plopping down a spaceship. Pads. Yeah. <laughs> and pads and maybe connecting them. And... Yeah. 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 It looked like it was a, a skyscraper city full of starships <laughs> that landed and parked. And, you know, those oh, yeah. would be where you would live, which is not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was also mentioned that, you know, there was going to be a lot of problems that had to be solved that weren't necessarily yeah. for SpaceX. But yeah. that, again, that was the, you know, the horse before the cart kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, as far as infrastructure, the, the closest was Gwen mentioning uh, Starlink uh, around yeah. Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And I think that's rather interesting because, you know, what are they thinking of it just for their needs for the human colony? Or are they looking at something more general purpose? Because I can imagine a lot of science missions would be excited to be able to piggyback off of that, uh, to, to see that that is something that would uh, reduce their costs and maybe also allow them to be able to their their data rates as far as whatever science is going on. So I don't see I, you know, I don't see any way they don't sell that uh, yeah. to any at least U.S. entity um, once they have it built. Yeah, start, then, starting I mean, with NASA, I, I, if you had I, something I'd like that around, that, how would that start, help your mission? Yeah, I'd love to see them start building that up uh, earlier rather than later. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think. One of the the principal challenges we're facing with pushing Mars sample return out is um, the assets on station are, are going to be aged beyond their planned life. So, and hmm. two of those are orbiters. Um, so, if there was a Starlink network out there, that would solve a pretty major problem. Um, yeah. Also, going forward, um, I don't see the geopolitical race. Um, easing up in the least. I only see friction increasing. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it perhaps is for the would be for the greater good that you'd have uh, a company like like SpaceX control the communication uh, infrastructure uh, because there is no one else to build it. Uh, at least there'll be, you know, you won't have a, a struggle for dominance in that. I don't know. This is my thought. What do you think, Ben? I think uh, geopolitical uh, tensions in space domain are a very healthy thing. Um, if as long as they're oriented towards exploration or, you know, um, even staking flags places, I think that's, you know, we're, we're competitive species. Um, and if that gets us out of our, our chairs and, and moving, then, then, then it's a wonderful thing. And it's, it's certainly better than, uh, the more direct tensions that can result from a lack of a, a way to proxy that conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so well said. Yeah. It, it, I, I mean, I want people in the U S to get concerned about China stealing our samples on Mars. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I, I want, you know, I want, I want that to be a race. It should be a race. Um, <laughs> and I think everyone would benefit from it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and the more assets other uh, other countries with industrial and technological capacity to go these go to these places or reach these places, the more assets they have up there, uh, 
the more they have a vested interest in protecting that domain for everybody's use, right? Like we see, yeah. we're seeing that in, in Leo. I want there to be thousands of Chinese satellites in Leo and thousands of Russian satellites if they can somehow manage it so that there isn't this asymm asymmetry where they can, you know, uh, cause Kessler, Kessler syndrome to cripple uh, an opponent in, in time of war with limited consequence for themselves, right? I think that that makes things safer for everybody if everybody's playing there. Yeah, I mean, of course, this is uh, this is <laughs> one of those things that we just have to wait and see how this pans out. I mean, I I, I hope we can be idealistic, um, but I suspect, like other things on Earth, this won't be as smooth um, a ride. But okay, so let's let's uh, is there is there anything else uh, before we get down to to science on Mars and you know colonizing Mars? Uh, Scott, uh, Ozan, and Ben, is there anything else that stood out to you from from Elon's presentation that day? Uh, transit speed. So one of the big things with the ITS, uh, the original ITS, and and what they had carried on into the Starship baseline was 80 to 150 day transit to Mars uh, on the outbound, um, which, you know, that range was for a particular uh, uh, trans-Mars injection Delta V, uh, which I, I think was about six kilometers per second. And, and, that, and that, that range would be because of uh, Earth-Mars alignment in different synods. Um, so sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's farther, um, and it can take longer with the same Delta V. Um, so that is you know, ridiculously fast for chemical, uh, but also entirely achievable when you have cheap uh, mass to Leo and, um, and refilling. Um, it's within Starship's capabilities to go that fast, but um, it, had, it hadn't really been baselined for a chemical system before because of that desire to minimize mass to orbit because that's, that was the expensive thing, right? It's like we're talking about like two to three times faster than a typical transit. Um, what we heard with this presentation was, uh, sorry, let me let me back up. Now, one one problem with that is that when you get to Mars, um, if you're if you're coming in that fast, you need a, a dramatically more performant uh, thermal protection system to enter now if you are already baselining coming coming returning to earth with your with your starship um uh, then uh that's already a, the pretty hot re-entry so um uh, bringing that to mars you know if, if you're building your system to be able to return to earth from mars then getting to getting to mars fast is not such a big problem uh, they had talked about using a different uh, thermal protection system for interplanetary uh, transit than they they would for for Earth. Right now, they have a low temperature uh, these low temperature silica tiles. Uh, they were talking about possibly using Pika, which they use on Dragon, which is an ablative uh, material that that could see multiple uses. So, like outbound, inbound, then it gets refurbished for the next next trip. Um, that was sort of what what they had talked about. Um, now they're talking about one way, right? And Elon specifically mentioned uh, five tankers uh, per outbound ship. Right. And what that sort of points towards is actually a slower transit, still faster than a Hama uh, transfer, still substantially faster than the slow, uh, than, than your typical slow transfer. Uh, I haven't done the math, but I would estimate somewhere closer to the six month range on average mm -hmm. instead of the four month range. Um, but it's not like, you know, full tanks on V2 or V3 Starship going as fast as it can. And mm -hmm. that might also um, make it such that uh, you can re-enter with the existing tiles um, and you don't have this problem of having to come back to Earth and, and doing the hot re-entry there. Cool. Scott? Yeah, I'm glad I was on to address that because that's what I was going to point out is like the faster you go there, the, the better braking system you need. And there's two ways to brake is either you bring along extra propellant to be able to do the retrograde, um, but then that means you're carrying more of it. Uh, the other is to do aero braking. 
And mm-hmm. you know, the question is whether they're going to do it like in one shot or whether they're going to do it a few times, to kind of capture it into orbit and then do the reentry after that and then save your fuel just purely for you know, the, the, uh, the landing portion of it. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is one of the downsides of it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole idea. If you're playing catch with someone and they, they throw something really easy to you, you can catch it, you know, without a baseball glove, but if they throw you a fastball man you know it's like you can't be wearing catcher's mitt sure. when you do it and that's the same problem that, that you have there so the faster you go the faster you're going to slow down which is like another reason you know and that limits your your usable payload that you can get there so i wonder if they would go into a highly elliptical orbit and just kind of graze off the atmosphere a few times slow yeah down. That, that that's that's what i'm wondering if they would do yeah. something like that and and hope that you don't overshoot <laughs> you got to make yeah. sure that first one is enough to slow you down and then you do it maybe a couple of times to degrade your, your orbit. That would yeah, be that, that's, the, yeah. that's the real limit that that first pass. So if you yeah. do a slow transit, you're coming in pretty close to escape velocity and you can break uh, easily into uh, in the, below escape velocity and capture. Uh, mm-hmm. if you're, their original baseline was for an 8.5 kilometer per second uh, uh, approach and Mars escape is around five. Uh, so mm-hmm. you would need to burn off over mm-hmm. 3.5 kilometers per second on that initial pass so either you're, you're doing a lot of uh propulsive braking which which it doesn't have you know you can't do six kilometers out uh, out and then 3.5 uh break mm-hmm. and then also you know that's that also that's land, past yeah. the limits of the system yeah. right so they were talking they were talking about braking with 8.5 which you know you can do if you have the right tps um it wouldn't it but wouldn't if it's crazy. one way then that means they they don't necessarily need to have heat tiles that are reusable so would it be better right. to go ahead and use a blade of, would it be lighter? I mean, you would, you would think, but it might be more expensive, right? So if you're not reusing the ship, I mean, maybe, maybe they started manufacturing the, these silica bricks and maybe they discovered, oh, this is cheaper than Pika. And if we're sending something one way then mm-hmm. uh, lowering the cost of that as much as possible. Right. All right. Cause if it's five um, tanker flights, and they're aiming for two to $3 million internal marginal cost for those flights, that's 10 to $15 million to fuel it. And the rest, most of the rest of that cost is in this one-way ship. And they're talking about sub-million dollar engines, six of those, that's a few million dollars. And, and you know, the steel for this ship is not very much. So you got to bring the cost of everything else down. The crew cabin you can reuse is your HAB. So that's going to cost whatever it costs, but you have to build that anyway. So if you can bring the cost of everything else down to, you know, single digit millions, then it, it can, it can dramatically impact the overall economics. So it's it might be that they decided it's cheaper this way, or maybe they they use the ship a bunch of times on Earth and then they <laughs> um, they send it out to Mars. I mean, I would I would expect there to be some customization, but maybe the tiles are are just a cheaper way to go, or they or you know did they avoid the development? Uh, what sort of learnings from from landing on the moon do you think they could take away and apply when it comes to Mars? Uh, something akin to what we call terrain relative navigation and, and be able to, um, you know, visually identify a landing site, uh, visually and computationally identify landing sites, um, I think is a really important thing that they're going to need to work on. Yeah. Uh, and Scott, I have to, how I you... to cut, cut the short, uh, I mean, you guys go on, but uh, I yeah. have to go. I, I wish no. I could keep it's been great having you. Uh, great to meet you. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. Nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 Was on. Yep. Looking forward to more of these and looking forward to yeah. hearing yeah. what you guys uh, say after I leave. A lot. <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, Scott, how much are you betting that we have a few Optimus bots um, on the first trip to Mars? Because, I mean, these are going to be unmanned missions. Uh, it doesn't hurt to send a couple of bots along. And I think by that time, uh, Optimus would be pretty mature as a technology. I, I think so. If if the first one is like five years, um, I think for sure it would be going along for the ride. And how much? Yeah, of a definitely be going, um, if anything, just to, to see what it, how it performs in that kind of environment and any issues in right. transit and everything else. But I'd be pretty sure that they wouldn't just be sending one, but they'd be sending quite a lot of them as part of that, that first payload. And that you would be thinking about whatever payload you're bringing is going to be sort of designed around the idea that you have these humanoid bots to to help you do the deployment and service and everything else. So, again, Elon keeps on talking about it. You know, the payload is data. 
again, you know, a lot of these things that you're sending, sending the optimist there is going to also be a lot of data because you want to see how it performs. And, you know, the other thing is just, it, you know, it turns out operating in one third gravity is, is very different than full gravity. And in some ways it's easier, but that also means you, you have to adapt to that. Um, and that things might be overpowered. So again, they might be saying, well, we don't want to send the, the, the earth scale one there. We want to send the, the Mars scale. Otherwise it's going to be like John Carter, right? It's just going to, you know, <laughs> throwing things too far, not having an idea of, of its own strength. Plus you yeah. can reduce the, the weight and everything else. So there'll be a lot of things you'd be able to learn from that. Right. I mean, especially when it comes to um, some of the basic things like, you know, the dull, dirty, boring jobs on uh, on Mars and building mm -hmm. infrastructure and just the basic building blocks. I don't think, um, you know, there's anything to replace Optimus uh, in terms of potential. I mean, you can't do that with a rover, can you, Ben? And we've had rovers stuck in the past and... Uh, I mean, how, off, how awesome would it be if you could just have uh, perhaps Optimus on Mars sorting out the problems with Perseverance, flicking those damn pebbles out of the way, <laughs> helping you get, get your samples back? Wouldn't it yeah. be cool? <laughs> it it would be. You know, I I I worry though that the you know often it's so that's uh, many degrees of motion. Um, you know, one of the hardest things with mobility on Mars is keeping joints lubricated because uh, traditional methods are will all immediately vaporize. Um, so uh, that would be an interesting solution to see if if they do send it. Like, what are they doing? You know, they have like uh, just in the arm, you know, eight degrees of freedom of motion there. So you know, you have at least yeah, that many that's joints. That's so some, it's like it's technically seven, but if you actually look seven. at all the different actuators, you've got a lot of other movement points in there. So you could yeah. argue, oh, maybe there's about a dozen. So as, as far as, like you say, um, surfaces that are moving or, or joints that would need to be lubricated, you would have to think about how to do it, whether you use a traditional lubricant or whether there's just like steel on some sort of polyethylene yeah. uh, kind of configuration. The, the one thing about the Optimus spot that's maybe a little bit different than most mechanical systems, it's not really designed to lift really heavy payloads. Mm -hmm. So you may not be quite as concerned of, of the kind of lubrication you need to have in there. But I agree, you, you need to have something kind of built in there to be able to do it. And then you yeah. also have to make sure it's, um, you know, got a really high IP rating. <laughs> you know, as it is, Optimus yeah, is designed for the factory right now. It's not designed to be working outside in, the, in yeah. weather. And yeah. Mars, Especially we know that on Mars, the dust the is going to be nasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's going to... And the other thing is you're going to want to have good communication with Optimus. So it, it's yep. going to be independent. Yeah, I was coming to that. I was going to ask you, yeah. do you think that they're going to have Starlink around Mars as yeah. the first first shot? That's, How do you communicate that, that's, with it? That's probably one of the strong reasons you'd want to do it is to be able to, to get all the valuable information that Optimus is collecting as well yeah. as being able to update any patches and everything else you'd want to have and yeah. figure out what the task class is. And and yeah. you want to be able to do a lot of data and, and be able yeah. to send it uh, – or not have to wait a long time to be able yeah. to upload, you know, a new neural net or anything like that. Uh, yeah. If you've got to send a couple of gigabytes, so yeah, you might have to wait twenty minutes for it to get there. But the thing is, you're not sending it at three hundred baud if you're able to send it yeah. at a really high bit rate. Yeah. And Scott, I remember in one of our earlier episodes, we we spoke about just how transformative, you know, these uh, having these laser satellite links would be uh, in in telecommunication. Um, I think by that time, you'd probably see this technology mature to. A, a very stable uh, level, right? So that's a, a lot of these pieces would be in place. It must be very stable if SpaceX is already selling this uh, plug and plazer package. Right. So it must be that they're so confident it, it's that easy just to plug into any sort of space platform that, that you have and be able to do that communication. And that's one thing to do in Earth orbit. It will be something else too between Mars and Earth. And we imagine there's going to probably be some relay stations involved, uh, especially when you're in opposition and you, you, you can't communicate to Mars for, I think, close to a month because yep. it's behind the right. sun. And so if you've got some Starlink satellites that are at some of the Lagrange points, you'd be able to use them as a relay station. Right. And you may also want to do it just to kind of cut down the distance between uh, Earth and Mars to give whatever that signal is you're sending a little bit of a boost. And as we can see, Starlink has no problem, you know, picking up a signal and redirecting it really quickly to <laughs> some other yeah. side of the planet, which just amazes me. It's one thing to, 
to actually have the, that those data packets coming in for them to be able to sure. quickly turn them around and send them somewhere else to me is remarkable that yeah and again you know the the, the proof is in the pudding right now we're having this conversation over starlink satellites with me and, and we can get an idea of what kind of lag is going on there as far as when i'm yeah. speaking and everything else so we can see it's not that bad now it's gonna be pretty bad for mars it's gonna be a 20 minute yeah. lag because there's or so what's what's the shortest i think it might be as short as somewhere like, between four? seven to 30 minutes one way yeah wow. yeah yeah one one way and so then it, so it could be be pretty bad but what's going to be more important is the fact that you can upload a lot of data so they can communicate now but it's just a trickle of data and the same yeah. thing remember the uh the new horizons when it went by pluto i think it take close to a year to download all that data yeah and i was just right. like you know it, it was a very short flyby because there was so much and the first thing i had to like download these really tiny thumbnails because no one knew it's like what's well, the one we want to have there and so from that they're trying to figure out like, that one <laughs> and then download yeah, it yeah. and decide the priority on it uh so if, you know anyone remembers what those old dial-up modems were like i think it was even worse than that was it as high as 300 baud or was it even less than that then? do you remember it, it was very low um yeah but i do you know i think we do already have you know we've we tested with psyche the the d instrument mm -hmm. um you know which it, you know, latency aside, uh, it was real time streaming of a cat video. We sent out there and beamed it yeah. right back. Um, yeah. So, you know, your your latency is entirely a function of your distance. So there's no escaping that. Um, but I think we'll be able to send large chunks at a time. Uh, you know, I, I think we're up to uh, about seven megabit with that connection uh, at 10 million miles. Um, so, it, it was still a 50 second latency, but you're getting everything else in real time once the transmission started. So I, I think, you know, that, that piggybacks right on top of what Starlink's already using with these laser interlinks. It's just mm. a more powerful laser and a larger receiving station. Yeah. So, and, and the other way to look at it is that, you know, one of the problems that they have with a, a lot of these systems is that they have to store all the data and then transmit it really slowly. So you have local storage problems of yeah. like, ah, and then you run out of space and like, we got to clear out the memory. And right mm -hmm. now, basically, you know, your transit time is your data buffer right there. Yeah, yeah. Know? It's like, yeah, seriously. you don't have to worry about storing it. It's like, it's on the way. And then we, yeah. we can clear that out. So and what then, what, would yeah. these, what what would these transformative bandwidths uh, do to science? I, I think, you know, coupled with, um, you know, we have a couple of limiting factors in, in terms of uh, getting data up and down from Mars. Uh, one of them is um, orbital passes from the two orbiters that we use as relay stations there, uh, which is basically twice a day. So we get, you know, one uplink or two uplinks and two downlinks um, on most days. And then uh, and then there's the actual data throughput. Um, and, you know, the, the most famous example I can think of of like um, data throughput challenges is is that a uh, photo of mars that the engineers colored by the numbers because mm -hmm. they were they didn't want to wait for the the actual photo data to come back down um i don't know if at this point it's transformative i think it's keeping up with the uh fidelity of the data that that we're generating you know as we get more and more refined scientific instruments up there and collecting data you know the 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 data packet or the data size uh, it gets much larger as well. Um, mm. it, I think that it it needs to happen, um, and it may be catching up right now, uh, but it's not too far behind what we need. I, we would really benefit, I think, a lot from uh, more than two communications passes per day. Um, that mm. would be a big change. For sure. um, yeah. And and with that, I think we could utilize these much larger uh, pipelines of data coming down. Um, mm. But it seems like all of these are are kind of growing together, which is good. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I mean, so the the entire ecosystem seems to be coming together, you know, in, in just the right time and at the right pace. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Ben. You know, so so NASA awarded a contract to Nokia to develop a a four G um, network for the moon. I'm kind of com compared to to something like Starlink. I mean, you know, it's it's always great to have redundancies in place and backups, but you know, what I'm just looking at the business models going forward. What do you think about it? Um, I'm actually really not that familiar with the contract they ordered. To, you said it was Nokia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm actually not very familiar with that. Um, 
Uh, but, I think uh, that was about four years ago. Yeah. Okay. It, so they were, I guess they were, they were, um, the contract was to uh, develop another t type of wireless infrastructure for uh, use in space. I, I think that that or, or, would be uh, for newer field communication or like newer distance communications, right? Yes. I, I, I think the idea is that if you're going to be expanding out of base, you'd like yeah. to have reliable communication. So they yeah. were going to put cell towers on the moon and they were going to be 4G, which kind of surprised me that, that uh, was that right at the time that 5G was coming out. But I think yeah. there were some reasons for that. And one is that um, 4G has a much longer distance that you can go. And mm -hmm. the thing about 5G is you get really high bandwidth. But I think sure. on the moon, you're more or less concerned with like making sure we have the coverage. And it was just about right as far as you know, the, the moon, the curvature is much higher. And so the question is, well, depending upon what the distance is, what, what do you really need? So five would have to be a, a lot closer together and four seemed to be about right for the curvature. Now, when I first heard about it, I, I thought that was like a funny headline. And evidently the onion actually got cut off guard as well because <laughs> everyone thought it was actually an onion headline and it was real. You and that to be real. They tried to figure out what can we do better on it. And so they, they showed a render of what the cell towers are actually gonna look like on the moon. And they're all disguised as pine trees. That's so funny. <laughs> That's really so, good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think based on it, they would need to have a tower at least like 100 meters tall to, to accommodate the curvature of the moon. Otherwise, wow. it's like out, out of range of the point. I tried. I remember doing some sort of calculation on that. And I think that's what made sense is that the fewer, the better, right? You don't want to have too sure. many of them and you want to have it reliable. And we're not talking about a million people. <laughs> Or you're trying right, to right. deal with the coverage of that. You're talking about a much smaller group. So 4G is probably more than, than good enough as far as communication. Interesting, yeah. And I, and I guess um, it's kind of funny because uh, thinking about Mars, you know, what we have at Mars is more similar to what Starlink is than it is to what we use for ground-based communication here. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're building our spacecraft all with direct-to-orbit comms capabilities, which... Uh, it would be nice if we follow that further, I think. Um, it, it seems like a more robust system and, and in some ways easier to construct. It's, if you're not if you don't you're not already on the planet or the moon, then it seems like it would be easier to put something in orbit around it than to land and build it. And of course, the biggest problem with the moon is it's very difficult to keep things in orbit around the moon. That's true. Yeah. Because of, of, it's it's this quirk of the, the moon that has this thing called a mass con. So basically, mm -hmm. its geometric center and its center of gravity are not quite the same. Sure. So orbits tend to degrade after a while, and it's really rare to get an orbit where they will stay in there for a long time. Yeah. I guess it can be done because there, uh, I believe there is like still one Apollo lander that uh, the the upper stage of one of the lunar modules is still in orbit around the moon, and it just was like luck. <laughs> that, oh wow! It yeah, happens yeah, yeah. to be just at the right one that's getting the right boost that it, it kind of oscillates back and forth. But many of the others. It's really difficult to keep them in orbit without a continual reboost. And, and the idea of the gateway was to get it like far enough out that you always have adequate coverage of the Southern uh, South Pole that you're always in like communication with us. So, I mean, everything was like worrying about how do we do the communication on the moon? And so in many cases that the best way is just to go ahead and build an infrastructure as opposed to trying yeah. to have these orbiters. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But Mars, you know, everything is fine. So you, you can keep it in there and it's in a very, very stable orbit. What, what would be the first things that you would like to see happen on the moon, on, on sorry, on Mars, uh, in terms of developing the infrastructure to support the science? I think we need to get into some of these caves. Um, we, there are some, you know, that's, that's one of the concepts that we've talked a little bit about for a potential future helicopter mission is uh, having it be a, a cave explorer. Um, I think that mm. presents... Um, it's a lot of opportunities for both habitation and science, uh, as well as, you know, you know, for searching for life, that's a really good place to go to go look for it. Um, so I, a plan to be able to use, you know, if we're going to cannibalize the starship materials, um, let's let's think about, you know, let's think about how we're going to do it. Um, you know, let's let's get some knowledge about. Uh, you know, is this is this something we can you know lean it on its side and and turn it into a, a pressure vessel for human habitation? Like, should it go into the cave? Does that 
does that help us with radiation exposure for people? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's a real problem on Mars too, is, is total ionizing dose uh, and human beings or even electronics for that matter. Right. Um, so. I mean, Optimus would need protection too. Uh, everything, yeah. I mean, yeah. everything we send there, it's uh, the rad hard electronic components. Um, you know, Perseverance is driving on a, with, with a computer that's uh, got the same processor as a 1992 edition of a Macintosh computer because uh, that's what BAE has built as, you know, the RAD 750. It's a RAD hard computer um, mm -hmm. and it's hard to deal with, uh, with radiation. It's probably the hardest thing for electronics in space. Um, but caves, caves offer us a natural protection against that. You know, um, a lot like in Europa, the, the ice crust, you know, we're excited about possible life on Europa because there's a 10 mile thick ice crust. Uh, and even though the radiation's uh, way more intense than anything that we've ever sent anything to before, uh, we believe that ice can can block it. And we think that the caves can do it on Mars. Um, so I, I'd like to see us target that. I, I think it would be really to be exciting for for everyone from science to those people that are, are focused mainly on on getting humans there. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, Scott, I think I heard um, Elon mention that you know the, the landing landing spots would be chosen that as such that they would be below the mean level, about a kilometer and a half to two below in the craters. Just talk us through that and and what do you think um, about what Ben just said? Okay, yeah, the the main reason we're going into what are the real lowlands is that the atmospheric pressure is going to be just a little bit higher. So that just helps overall, especially it, you know, because our atmosphere is blocking a lot of the radiation. So the more that you have of that, the better. Also, depending upon where you are, you may have like these walls that are coming up a little bit. So that means you're, you're getting a little bit of protection from the fact that you have those walls. The, the main problem with most of the HABs is going to be the, the radiation that's coming straight above. As you get closer and closer to the horizon, it's not as bad because the atmosphere is very thick. That's why sunsets are orange because there's so much more light that the sun has to go through. So that gives you a little bit of protection. So I'm not sure exactly what the angle is there, but for the most part, if you have like a really good cover above you, you can probably have some sort of windows that will bring in some light to allow you to see without worrying about radiation coming in. And of course, in Mars, you can make those windows out of ice if you want, mm -hmm. because it'll be cold enough and you can make it as thick as you want and you can make it very, very clear. So it'll be as good as having glass on, on Earth, but it'll be far more protective as far as radiation. Um, now, certainly, you know, building those HABs will re require a lot of effort. So at first, it does make sense to go into those caves to, to be able to see what's in there. The other thing is, is that usually when I think of these, these caves, um, you know, some process was involved in creating those things. So it'll be geologically interesting, one thing to see how were they created usually think of them being maybe volcanic or something like that, or it's some sort of flow, but it also means there's going to be resources in there. We're just not aware of. So you right. go in there and you may find all sorts of deposits of very valuable minerals that you need that you're not finding out there uh, normally. You also have no idea of when you go in there where there's suddenly um, you have much easier access to water and other ices that might be in there. So there's a lot of reasons to want to go in there because you know, my overarching Important thing is what that about we got to identify habitats? the resources we need. You know, where's where's the water we're going to need? Where are we how are we going to produce the oxygen mm -hmm. and everything else? And it may be that the caves is like the answer to a lot of those. I was going in there mm -hmm. right away, and and it, you know, especially if they go down, because a lot of times to get the stuff you've got to dig down. Well, yes. the caves are kind of already accomplished some of that for you, so it may make a lot easier for excavation. Right. And do you think uh, the boring company has uh, a task? It's got tasks cut out from Mars. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. Everything Elon does, you know, and I think like the size of, of the boring machines fits inside of like a starship. You know, it's just kind of designed that way. And there's a reason it's electric, and, and you know, it's uh, it's mm -hmm. not using um, diesel fuel or any sort of fossil fuel because at least the expectation is we're not going to find any fossil fuel on, on Mars. Now, if we do, that That'd would be, cool. be a very interesting That'd discovery. Cool. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. That would be yeah. very cool. Still, still a challenge on the oxygen side, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that too, that too. I mean, yeah. we, it's and and I sort of agree with, with you know what Ozan was saying is that the return missions are very tough because while Moxie was successful, 
it's not yeah. producing like the vast quantities of oxygen that you would need. Oh, it's tiny amounts. Yeah, but, so, but, but but do you that need a lot of energy? Scalable? That's the problem. It's well, it's scalable if you have the energy. That that's why you'd have to bring a small yeah. reactor along with you to be able to do Which it. Which was my really next question. Do it with solar. Yeah. And Elon yeah. said, like, assuming we get permission to to be able to to send one of those things because a private company dealing with uh you know radioactive material, there's who knows what kind of treaties and everything else there are. But a lot of the problems with terraforming Mars doesn't come down to so much um whether there are resources available, it's whether there's enough energy available. Yeah. Because you've got to go through all these chemical processes and breaking bonds and forming bonds, everything requires a lot of energy. So you got to figure out where you're going to do that. So yeah, the atmosphere is like really thin, but in bulk, there's plenty of oxygen. If we can just figure out how to pull it out and we can pull yeah. it out very easily, given enough energy. And how do you keep it there once you generate that those gases, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. And to me, that's, that's the biggest challenge about terraforming is, you know, I think we... We can say they're like ambitious, but we we understand how to create these atmospheric gases, um, but we don't yet understand how to restart a planetary core to create a magnetic field to keep it there. Yeah, that's that's well, big. I think we, Elon's, we need Elon's a magnetic field. About setting off a few uh, nuclear bombs on the poles. It still no, wouldn't. No. I mean, he was talking about melting ice with that, um, but yeah. it still doesn't address the you know. That we need liquid iron or something in the core to to create a magnetic field to protect your atmosphere from getting blown away from the solar winds. Yeah, basically, what the idea there was to to try to melt the carbon dioxide up there to thicken the atmosphere to try to help with the radiation protection. But now you just have like a very heavy carbon dioxide atmosphere, which maybe does a, a little bit for you as far as like the the greenhouse effect. But the number of nukes that you would have to set off to produce the energy to melt that is just like it's ridiculous astronomical like, there's just it, it won't have any impact whatsoever so then how do you the only the way problem? you can do it is you need to get like probably a really big magnifying glass in space that's just focusing the solar energy on there for a long period of time that's why i say it comes down to that so the only way to do the terraforming is you have to do it under a dome you just can't do it in a large area at first you got to capture yeah. in there and eventually hope and then figure out how to restart it because again as ben points out we can put all those gases up there and what's going to happen is it's just eventually going to boil off into space and we yeah. don't want that we want to keep it there and it's not just making the atmosphere thick it's protecting it from the solar wind and you need a really good magnetic field a couple of ideas on that one is that you actually create a magnetic field in space at one of the lagrange points that envelops mars that's one way of doing it the other which i was actually joking about this and it turns out there's actually some researchers that are serious is like well, just do like what I did as a kid is like, you know, take some bell telephone wire, wrap it around a 16 penny nail and like you, you know, put a big D cell on there. Why don't we do the same thing with Mars? You know, just like do that kind of thing through the core. And, but that'd be kind of ridiculous actually trying to, to get something to go all the way down. However, the core is made out of iron. And some scientists said, well, all you need to do is actually wrap that thing around the equator a few times and then power yeah. it up somehow. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's an interesting concept. I, I didn't realize you know, that that is a potential way that you would be able to do it just like we are able to make um, a, a simple magnetic field here on earth. Uh, the only thing is like, how big a D cell do you need for that yeah. to be able to yeah. do it? Where do you get yeah. that energy? And the one thing that I've always wondered is that if you're able to bootstrap the magnetic field, and now the solar wind's coming in and it's going to start being attracted to the poles, just like we have the Aurora Borealis. And now you get the stream of, of particles coming out, high energy particles. Is there some way you could capture that yeah. to literally create yeah. the electric charge or the field that you need to run the field, you know, and bootstrap it on that? And I've talked to some physicist friends like that, and they just look at me strange, <laughs> shake their head and say, no, Scott, <laughs> you can't do that. But I'm just hoping like there's some crazy guy out there that will think about that and say, well, yeah, I mean, it's like, think yeah. about when, when it comes in, the atmosphere is being lit up with this aurora. Is that like a lot of energy or a little energy? And if it's a lot yeah. of energy, and if there's some way we can take that and bottle it and use it to keep the magnetic, and just think, the stronger the magnetic field you make, right. the more of those particles you're able to attract in. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. But of course, just to be clear, when we're talking about terraforming, this is, what, a couple of centuries yeah. um, that we're looking the, the at. Millennia. Right? <laughs> it is a, it is yeah, at least, to begin just with. The, the levels of energy required to do what you would need to do to protect the atmosphere that you're creating um, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would I would guess they're in excess of 
everything humanity's ever produced. It's like Kardashev level two, I think. I was just about to say that we we need to get onto the scale first. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea what it is, but it, it's it's a tremendous amount um, of, of energy that you need. So you, you can do little things, you can melt ice here and there, but I mean, there's a lot of energy that goes into melting an ice cube. You don't realize yeah. that. And see, th this has always been the conundrum about you know some of the um, uh, the melt waters that we've had of, of what caused the, the polar ice caps to melt really rapidly for a while and what was the energy for, source for that is that it was a lot of meltwater that came really really quickly and that's hard to describe from the normal kind of solar uh influx that you would have and whether there was some other event which is why a lot of people think there was like an impactor or something like that that mm -hmm. could have created it so yeah it's it's not as easy as you think to to be able yeah. to melt a is this what the younger dryest that you're talking about yeah yeah yes mm -hmm. and scott the concept that you you presented of uh using ice for the dome itself um is not one that i thought about before but i think that's a, a real, well, that's mit ridiculous. thought about it it's not my it's, idea well, it's still um <laughs> yeah. it, it's fantastic you know because i mean you don't you don't want to carry glass to mars that's really yeah. heavy and um you know you want you have the water there it's already in the the state that it needs to be in. you just have to kind of reform it a little bit um so that's probably the most realistic uh proposition that i've heard yet uh yeah and, to... and i've seen it is like uh when it went skiing in switzerland they had one like one of those uh ice hotels yeah uh, that was an igloo and it was interesting to go through there that there were some cases where i went in there i was looking at like some art or something like that and it was like wow that just looks really weird and i didn't realize it was like encased in ice and the ice was yeah. so pure that i mean you could not see anything i mean so you realize that it doesn't take that much to make ice sure. as clear as glass and sometimes even better but, but don't we're not used to it because it all cold. the impurities that get in there and the way it, it, it freezes normally. But all you have to do is make sure you kind of melt it and freeze it in the proper way. And Yeah. What about planetary defense? Because let's not forget that you do have uh, impacts on Mars. And uh, this was uh, an impact creator, I think that was around Christmas of 2022. Uh, and that's how we found a lot more water ice on Mars near the equator. Mm -hmm. So... You can't also not take into account impacts on the surface. And when it comes yeah. to building habitats, that's something you really need to. I mean, you don't have an atmosphere that will help you burn off these objects. Yes. So th there's probably a greater chance of having impactors on Mars than, than Earth, just for that reason, because you, you don't mm -hmm. have the atmosphere that's going to burn that up. Uh, same time, I'm not sure how often they are. And so while it's a concern, it's not something that people probably would lose sleep over. Uh, you know, there's there's many other things that could go wrong. You know, something like yeah. that happens, then boy, you're really unlucky. Um, yeah. And that you know, eventually, they you know, along with the overall planetary defense that we're looking at here on Earth is like, is we're trying to map all the asteroids that are out there, and we're not just going to look at the ones that might hit Earth. We we need to look at all of them because we don't know which ones mm -hmm. are going to hit Earth or not. And from you probably say, oh, guess what? By the way, that might be uh, a dangerous object that Mars has to worry about. Now. It, it could also work both ways that coming up with a planetary defense for Mars will make it easier to identify a lot of asteroids that are very difficult to see from Earth. Yeah. So um, it could work both ways that if both of them are trying to protect themselves, they could be protecting both. Right. Or just put in a couple of lasers out there in space in orbit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to work quite that. It, the, the main thing is time, is that it, if, if you know ahead of time, then it's fairly easy to mitigate the situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's only if, if you've got a matter of days or weeks, then it might be really, really hard to, to do anything. And the best you might be able to do is deflect it enough to not hit your habitat. That's about it, you know, it's, right. as opposed to not hitting, you know. And of course, the other thing is, is figuring out is it even going to hit the habitat. You know, it's like the chances are just very, very small yeah. and until Mars is like covered with habitats. I wouldn't worry that much about it. Yeah, I don't think we yeah. can worry too much about it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's not much you can do. It's like we we don't worry about lightning all that much. I mean, we try to do something to mitigate it, but the, the sure. Uh, you know, and then we have a lot of lightning storms, a lot of bolts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when I look around here in Florida, it's like there is a lot. I see a lot of strikes all the time, and when these thunderstorms come through, man, it is just something else. And every now and then, I'll hear a strike that's really close, but I have yet to hit have one hit my property. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, so you would think by now, you know, with, with all the stuff that you have. So, and the chances of, of you know, of a meteor or, or an asteroid or something like that hitting Mars on any particular day is really, really remote. 
Yep. And then, you know, the particular spot you're on is just about zero. So, yeah, you, you have a better chance of winning the lottery. <laughs> twice. Yeah, twice. twice. Yeah. <laughs> In the same day. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I mean, you know, it's, it's easy to get carried away um, when you talk about these fanciful ideas. But I think it's it, a bit of circumspection is, is very handy. Uh, especially in these times, yeah. we need to understand timelines, um, and that these are technologies that are still evolving. And though we've done some great um, science on the moon and on Mars and on asteroids, uh, we need to also be realistic <laughs> about you know sure. the timelines and, and the successes that we can expect of them. But but the future does look bright and very hopeful, and let's hope we get there um, in one piece. Before uh, and we don't uh, blow us, ourselves up, you know, at the rate at which we're going. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it this be is incredible to see people make the trip in in my lifetime. Um, even if it's just oh, yeah. one one way or return, it would be. Uh, would you go, Ben? Would you go? I wouldn't go. <laughs> uh, what about you, Scott? Absolutely, I would. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't. Absolutely, I I would go. I mean. It, even Again, if this it's is some, one this is something I thought about what, well over 20, 25 years ago when yeah. Robert Zubin came up with that and thinking about, oh, it should be a one-way trip. And if it's going to be a one-way trip, the one-way trip is best done with people that are, let's say, older as opposed to younger because basically it's not like we're we're throwing away the good years or, or we're going to have any regret. At, at this point, we're mature enough, everything else, we've been able to get our affairs in order. And if something happens to us, it's not as tragic as when we send 18-year-olds off to war. Okay, so it's like, oh, okay, we're going to go there. We're going to try to do this this frontier, and you know, you you screen yourselves for all sorts of medical issues, and you realize that when you're there, you might have 10, 20 years max before you know something happens. It's like, well, that's fine. If I hang around on Earth, I probably have 10 or 20 years anyway, so it doesn't matter. So, so yeah, I would I would absolutely do it. Um, and the, the other thing is is a lot of times that when you start talking about people in like their 50s and 60s. A lot of those that were going, well, people who were probably scientists, many of them operated in the field. They know what it's like mm -hmm. to, to be, you know, you can be sending geologists and geologists, they're out in the field, they're in the wild, they, they, they know how to do it. They know how to take care of themselves. And so again, and, and for sure, you're going there, have our, a few our with pioneers a lot of experience and explorers. On the moon. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to see the same thing, but the, you know, the moon is, is like, you know, it's practically a day trip or, you know, it's, a, it's pretty easy yeah. there and back. You, you, you know, you're going to be yeah. coming back, but with Mars, you do need a particular mindset. Mm -hmm. But there are people that willingly go down to Antarctica. And the reason why they go down there is they want to be away from people. <laughs> they, they like what they're going down there, but they actually prefer to be down there than with, you know, the other. And so that means there are enough people that are literally crazy enough to go to Mars that will be able to go yeah. there and do the science and the work. And yeah. I don't know, I might be one of those. I, I, I would. I would join in a, in a heartbeat. So my, my former profession, I actually lived and worked on ships. And so I'd be mm -hmm. out at sea for six months a year. Um, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's uh, it, 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 you, your, your frame of mind changes, you adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, I, it's well within human social capability and, and mental capability to, to do that for sure. Um, I think people do harder things than, than be isolated. Um, yeah. By and, choice. And, and I think it's easier if you think about, you know, our, our four parents that, that came across from the, the, yeah. the from Europe, they, there was no going back. A lot of them was a yeah. one way trip. And, you know, they said goodbye to all their, their relatives on the, the other side and never see them again. Very limited communication and all yeah. um, going to Mars will be a little bit easier. Yeah. Even if it's one way, the thing is, there's still going to be the Internet. There's still going to be yeah. all the you're still going to have. Oh, yeah. connections. You're still going to be able to see what's going on. And again, it, the mindset is going to be, do you have any sort of attachments that would really keep you from, you know, yep. uh, do you have grandchildren that you really want to see grow up? And if you do, then you want to stay in, in, on Earth. But if you don't or if, or if you're maybe a little bit estranged or something like that, there's a lot that will just say it's not a problem to, to go ahead and do it. But you still would be able to have those ties. Things are still going to be coming from Earth for resupply and everything else. Yep. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the way I'm painting it is probably like the first explorers <laughs> of Mars is like, no, no. So somehow you're, they're, they're not sure going to have be, a lot more creature comforts. Yeah, you'd have yeah, the internet. Yeah. Oh, you'd have I mean, Netflix. yeah, you're going to get used to it, and you're going to you're <laughs> and you'd, have, to you'd have you'd have you'd have humanoid bots to take care of you. And oh. you and and the food's going to suck. I mean, there's there's no yes, doubt about it's it. It's going to be horrible. It's, it's, it's going to be very limited. Um, but you know, there are people. Well, the that, views are going to be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, views should. Yeah, be I mean, I, I say no because I've got an 18 month 
old daughter and I just can't imagine like leaving her. Exactly. So, which is which is why you wouldn't go now. But you know, that that could Maybe change in 30 years. In 30 years. Sure. You know, it'd still be tough yeah. because you know, but at that point you you might be a bit more comfortable with that idea. Uh, yeah. and you know, whether you want to do it, but for a lot of people like, no, it's like, I'll do it as like a round trip, but though it's a one-way trip, maybe not. Oh boy. This has been such a fantastic chat yeah, with you guys. Uh, it's been so much fun. Uh, we've, we've spoken about quite a lot. <laughs> um, I would have loved to drill down a bit on, on a few more subjects, but we'll de- leave that for another time. So let me just pull up your profiles before we end. Um, okay. this, this is, uh, Scott Walter. He's going ballistic five on X. Uh, Ozan, who was with us uh, a little while back, is at uh, Ozan Bellic uh, on X. And this is Ben uh, on LinkedIn. And you can also reach out to him on X. It's been so great having you. Thank you so much for your time. And, uh, you know, I, I hope we can do this again because it's been fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Royden. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Royden.